student of voice um, and music history at SJSU, um, and you just heard Nedeke Yaros' uh, Sep Hammer and Ben Rudiak Gould. I'd like to thank my professors, Jonathan Smucker and Dr. Gordon Haramaki. Uh, please uh, silence your cell phones. There is no intermission, uh, so I won't take it personally if you have to get up. Um, you can do that while I'm speaking. I'll be doing a lot of speaking in between our songs. Um, please join us for a post-concert reception. Uh, it's just out here and to the right, we passed, or actually it's before the, the bathrooms. 
and there's a glass door that leads out into the courtyard over here. Uh, we are attempting our version of medieval pronunciation, what that might have sounded like, possibly. If you hear anything weird, uh, that's why. <laughs> uh, so the songs start roughly in chronological order, but then uh, they diverge later and based on the themes that are being explored. Uh, I'll be reading excerpts between each song that reflect the history, the thematic material, and even composer relationships. Uh, I'm not going to specify which of these it is, uh, but there is more explanation in the program notes. Uh, you can access that with the QR code on the front, but uh, that's absolutely not necessary. In fact, you, you, know, pro you probably want to say that until you get home. Um, the idea for this concert came from reading Love in the Western World by Denis de Rougemont. Uh, his main thesis is that our Western ideals of love are heavily influenced uh, by this Middle Age period, the medieval period, and the, specifically the Cathars, which is a, a heretical Manichaean cult or sect, and the troubadours uh, of southern France, who was associated with them, and, and their fascination with obstacles of love, most notably death. <laughs> uh, and uh, I came upon this book via Rene Girard's book, Deceit, Desire, and the Novel, which is um, basically literary uh, critique and, and theory. He expounds his theory of mimetic desire in that, sometimes referred to as triangular desire, um, which says we learn what or whom to desire from role models, which he calls uh, mediators, uh, which form a triangle with the literary subject and the object uh, of that subject's desire uh, as the other two vertices. Um, he, distraw, he draws a distinction between cases where the model is far away or, or even fictional, uh, which he calls external mediation, and when he or she is close to the subject, uh, perhaps even rivalrous with them, um, that would be internal mediation. Uh, there is gendered language in, the, uh, in, in all the texts, really, but uh, all of the ideas really hold true if you switch the sexes. So keep that in mind. Uh, the, the title comes from the next song on the program, Amor mi fa cantar a la Francesca, uh, which translates to, and you'll see in the translation, it translates to love makes me sing to Francesca, but it can also mean Love makes me sing in the French style. <laughs> and uh, I felt that it's reflected the mimetic nature of Western love and music, uh, which had already made its way from France to Italy by the 14th century. Actually, I'll mention, too, the edition that I was able to find on the wonderful cpdl.org uh, was actually done by Richard Nix, who's sitting over there. So <laughs> thank you, Richard. <laughs> It seems to us natural that love should be the commonest theme of serious, imaginative literature, but a glance at classical antiquity or at the Dark Ages at once shows us that what we took for nature is really a special state of affairs, which will probably have an end, and which certainly had a beginning in the 11th century in Provence. An entirely new kind of poetry sprang up in the south of France, the birthplace of Catharism. It extolled the lady of thoughts, the platonic idea of a feminine principle, and the encouragement of love contrary to marriage, and at the same time of chastity. A neo-Manichaean heresy come from the Near East through Armenia and Bogomil, Bulgaria, that of the good men or Cathars, Ascetics who condemned marriage, but who founded a church of love in opposition to the church of Rome. Swiftly spread over France from Rheim and from the north of Italy, pushed into Spain, and then spread all over Europe. Oh, oh, oh. 
In a general way, it is difficult to check, I'm sorry, let me start over. The adoption of certain linguistic conventions naturally involves and fosters the rise of latent feelings most apt to be expressed in this way. That is the sense in which it may be said that following La Rochefoucauld, that few people would fall in love had they never heard of love. I came to Carthage, where a cauldron of illicit loves leapt and boiled about me. I was not yet in love, but I was in love with love, and from the very depth of my need hated myself for not more keenly feeling the need. I sought some object to love, since I was thus in love with loving, and I hated security and a life with no snares for my feet. Tristan and Isolt do not love one another. They say they don't, and everything goes to prove it. What they love is love, and being in love. 
They behave as if aware that whatever obstructs love must ensure and consolidate it in the heart of each and intensify it infinitely in the moment they reach the absolute obstacle, which is death. St. John's saying that God is love has long been balanced in my mind against the remark of a modern author, Monsieur Denis de Rougemont, that love ceases to be a demon only when he ceases to be a god. Which, of course, can be restated in the form begins to be a demon the moment he begins to be a god. Which uh, sorry, this balance 
seems to me an indispensable safeguard. If we ignore it, the truth that God is love may slyly come to mean for us the converse, that love is God. In order to counter this powerful and almost universal rise of love and the cult of idealized woman, the church and clergy were bound to set up a belief and a worship which met the same profound desire as this sprang up out of the communal spirit of the time. While the church had to fall in with that desire, the church had also to convert it and lead it into the strong stream of orthodoxy. Hence, the repeated attempts from the beginning of the 12th century onward to institute a worship of the Virgin. The worship of the Virgin responded to a vital necessity for the Church while under threat and pressure. When several centuries later the papacy sanctioned that worship, the latter, without waiting for the seal of dogma, had already triumphed in all the arts. <laughs>
Western world, recognizes that every passion feeds on the obstacles placed in its way and dies in their absence. From this, de Rougemont concludes that desire should be defined as a desire of the obstacle. The observations in Love in the Western World are remarkable, but the explanatory synthesis at this stage seems inadequate. Any synthesis is incomplete, which ends in an object or an abstract concept, and not in a living relationship between two in individuals. Every man has only one way of desiring women, of seeking love or success, in other words, of desiring divinity, but it is not the permanence of being on which middle-class consciousness prides itself. It is a permanence of nothingness. Nothingness. Desire never actually acquires its true object. It leads to failure, oblivion, and death.
The hero of external mediation proclaims aloud the true nature of his desire. He worships his model openly and declares himself his disciple. Imitation is no less, no less strict and literal in internal mediation than in external mediation. If this seems surprising, it is not only because the imitation refers to a model who is close, but also because the hero of internal mediation, far from boasting of his efforts to imitate, carefully hides them.
Indifference plays a role in the genesis of these desires, which would seem to contradict the results of our analyses. In sexual desire, the presence of a rival is not needed in order to term the desire triangular. The beloved is divided into both subject and object in the lover's eyes. This division produces a triangle whose three corners are occupied by the lover, the beloved, and the body of this beloved. To imitate one's lover's desire is to desire oneself, thanks to that lover's desire. This particular form of double mediation is called coquetry. The coquette does not wish to surrender her precious self to the desire which she arouses, but were she not to provoke it, she would not feel so precious. The favor she finds in her own eyes is based exclusively on the favor with which she is regarded by others. For this reason, the coquette is constantly looking for proofs of this favor. She encourages and stirs up her lover's desires, not in order to give herself to him, but to enable her the better to refuse him.
The coquette's indifference toward her lover's sufferings is not feigned, but it has nothing to do with ordinary indifference. It is not an absence of desire. It is the other side of a desire of oneself. The lover is fascinated by it. In this case, as in others, it is nearness which brings about the conflict. In the universe of internal mediation, indifference is never simply neutral. It is never pure absence of desire. When double mediation invades the domain of love, all hope of reciprocity vanishes. In his notes, Flaubert formulates this absolute principle that two beings never love each other at the same time. <laughs> The struggle ends when one of the partners admits his desire and humbles his pride. Henceforth, no reversal of imitation is possible, for the slave's admitted desire destroys that of the master and ensures his genuine indifference. The word is not too strong, and it reveals the nature of the struggle. In double mediation, each one stakes his freedom against the others. Enslavement is always the final result of desire, but at first it is very distant and the desiring subject cannot perceive it. The eventual result becomes increasingly clear as the distance between mediator and subject decreases and the phases of the metaphysical process are accelerated. You've heard the blind men play at the court of Burgundy, haven't you? Surely, yes. Was there ever such a do? I've seen Benchway feel shame and fall silent before their challenge, and Dufay angered and frowning because he cannot muster such lovely euphony.
I suppose that everyone who has thought about the matter will see what Monsieur de Rougemont meant. Every human love, at its height, has a tendency to claim for itself a divine authority. In renouncing divinity, the hero renounces slavery. Every level of his existence is inverted. All the effects of metaphysical desire are replaced by contrary effects. Deception gives way to truth, anguish to remembrance, agitation to repose, hatred to love, humiliation to humility, mediated desire to autonomy, deviated transcendency to vertical transcendency. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds.
What was it, O oh Lord my God, that moved me to dedicate these books to Hieros, an orator of Rome? I had never seen him, but I was won to him for the fame of his learning, which was indeed very notable, and I had heard these things he had said, which seemed to me ad admirable. But he pleased me mainly because he pleased others. They praised him. Thus, a man is praised, and we love him, though we have in fact never seen him. Does such a love pass from the lips of the one who praises into the heart of the one who hears the praise? Not at all. Simply, one lover is inflamed by another. That is why we are one to a man we hear praised only if we believe that the praise comes from a sincere heart. That is, when we, sorry, when the praise is uttered by one who truly loves. <clears throat> Place me like a seal over your heart like a seal on your arm, for love is as strong as death. Thank you. 